to the live stream. This week we've got Carrie King. We're gonna talk about the economic superorganism. Are all economists bugs? Maybe. Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the stream. We've got Carrie King as a guest today. It is September 2nd already. We've been doing the show 10 months now. It's exciting. We've got a full crew um, back this week. We've been missing Mike. We've been missing Steve. I'm going to bring on Steve right away because it's been almost a month. Here he is, Steve. Hi, guys. I'm glad to be back. Last week, as you know, I was... uh... Deep in the in the bowels of COVID, so uh, I'm better this week, but I haven't had a chance of anything sartorial in the meantime. So let's hope I can man- manage two hours here. Steve, where are you at right now? In Budapest, I've just moved here for a uh, six months research stint with a group called the Budapest Center for Long Term Sustainability. Its website is bc4, not the number four, ls.com, and. Uh, it's a center that's been established by the central bank here. Uh, they're the ones who invited me over, plus a number of universities, including John von Neumann University. So I hope uh, to be working with non-Orthodox researchers here. And there's a very strong non-mainstream approach to economics that's part of the central bank's uh, philosophy. So with a bit of luck, I'll be working with them fairly constructively over the next six months and hopefully giving some lectures at John von Neumann University as well. Nice. Very, very nice. It's um, it's good to see that you're actually going to be lecturing. You know, that's how for everybody that knows, that's how I really first viewed Steve. I think it was one random YouTube lecture he was watching showing the, the Minsky software and the rest is history. Everybody in the chat. Hello. Ghost on the half shell. Michael D'Souza Cruz. Snurt Rich. Um, web freaks and a number of others. Thank you for joining. Gonna bring in Mike next because he's back. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? Hey, yeah, uh, I'm doing well. Um, just uh, we're off to the races uh, at WPI for the term, and we're just getting all of our uh, classes and thesis students scheduled and what have you. So uh, system dynamics is. Uh, is kicked off and uh, all is well. Nice, very nice, very nice. So uh, right now, since I asked where Steve's at, where are you at right now? I am in my basement office in Sterling, <laughs> Massachusetts. Very, very nice. Next person we're going to bring on is the man, Daniel Sanderson. Yeah. 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 Daniel. How you doing? Dan the man. How's Dan the man doing? Pretty good. Pretty good, Ty. Yeah. Yeah. I, good. I, good. I, yeah. That's it. Well, little awkward. I was going to say, I was going to give you props for the new, to the new lead in with Steve. And I was so excited to see him see the new intro and the artwork and stuff like that. So mm, good, good job, Ty. Yeah, that was just, your, 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 your craft is getting better and better as time progresses so yep. just think in a couple of years if we're all still together it'll be a professional show but yeah. until then <laughs> it's stitched together as always <laughs> yeah. daniel where are you at in the world right now victoria bc canada oh wow i i know the area very beautiful part of the world <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i guess it, it's time we're gonna bring him on Carrie King, second time here. Carrie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I can give an official hook em horns for the second time. It's two and University of Texas at Austin. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't I don't have your tr- Twitter handle. I have last week's uh, guest, Clint Bollinger, still. So 
No, oh, it still um, says I'm Clint Mullinger. Yeah. 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 So if you uh -oh. need to find out where Clint is on Twitter, well, there you go. I'll, I'll work yeah. on Carrie's Twitter handle in a bit. But you can find Carrie at CarrieKing.com because he's got a book that you should really purchase if you haven't purchased yet. It's called The Economic Super Organism. There it is. There right it is. There, got there it is. <laughs> oh, I've got it. I've got it prepped already. Right. Gary, it's it's been eight months or so. How's life treating you? Eight months have been uh, uh, pretty good. I've uh, been uh, making good progress on some uh, modeling with my postdoc, uh, Neeraj Hunamanti, who'll be looking for a job at the end of this year. So if anybody needs somebody who's learned a lot about life cycle assessment and uh, economics and uh, heterodox economics, he's, he's out there. Uh, did a bit of traveling uh, this summer. Uh, to conferences, saw Steve in uh, the Netherlands, along with uh, Robert Ayers, Bob Ayers. So a uh, little traveling around, a little sharing uh, the latest uh, research we've been doing and uh, helping on some other things at the Biophysical Economics Institute, uh, which I'm a board member. We've just awarded, uh, well, we've, de we've decided, haven't officially, I think, told the team <clears throat> that won, but we've decided on a, a team to uh, receive the first award uh, from this institute, which is focused on biophysical economics and net energy analysis. Uh, and so that's a, a good step for this, uh, this group going forward. And we're going to try to see if we can get more people interested in these ideas so we can you know, use this as a conduit to fund uh, biophysical economics research. Nice. Where is that institute? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a virtual institute. Uh, the, uh, in terms of virtually being online, uh, yeah, it's you know, BP, uh, what's the, uh, I'll type it in the chat, but uh, bpeinstitute.org is the website. And then on Twitter, it is uh, at instbio or at instbio. Uh, so so Michael, the, D'Souza, Michael D'Souza Cruz wants to know, what is the economic super organism? Tell us all about it. Right. Uh, well, the idea is that uh, the economy, in some sense, has many of the same properties as biological organisms in terms of how it uses energy and structures itself and the, its patterns of growth. And this idea, I think, has been around a long time, maybe over 100 years. I think the last proposal I wrote, one of unsuccessful, I think one of the uh, reviewers was saying, well, you didn't even reference this old social science researcher from 100 plus years ago. And of course, I didn't. I didn't know who, who they were, and uh, I, I looked them up briefly, briefly, and I thought, okay, yeah, it seems seems relevant, but I'm not sure it proves I didn't know what I was thinking about any anymore or not. Uh, but a lot of people have had this, uh, this this kind of idea over time, so it's probably you know over 100 years old. And I'm summarizing some of that knowledge, of course, not I don't know all of it. Um, but one of the sort of intriguing features. Uh, is to is relating um, essentially all energy consumption, primary energy consumption, to size of the economy, and most people do this by measuring GDP as a metric of size of the economy. And if you if you do this uh, over time, and uh, I have a paper that's still under review, uh, but a draft is out there on uh, kind of the draft land on the web uh, from 1900. This is with uh, work with a guy named uh, Andrew Jarvis in Lancaster University. If from 1900 to about 1970, there's a one-to-one -one sort of relationship between energy consumption and GDP. So get 2% more energy, or GDP, it comes with 2% more uh, energy. After the 1970s, you end up in what people would call the relative decoupling zone or a, a sublinear scaling of energy in relation to size. So uh, after 1970, have roughly 3% more GDP comes with only 2% more energy. And so it's sublinear when you say energy is proportional to GDP to some power, it's like to the power of two thirds. So this uh, oftentimes economists or people in economic thinking say, okay, this is us trying to become more efficient and uh, in the sense of using energy to have economic output. If you look at animals and other, what would be called super organisms, which are like ant colonies and termite colonies. So they're an organism, they act as a whole, but they're not individually, you can point to individual ants. Uh, and termites, and so this is from the ecology and biology literature, uh, as well as animals, mostly uh, you know mammals, 
They also have this so-called sublinear scaling, and this was called Kleiber's rule, and it's been known since, well, at least this pattern has been recognized since the 1930s in biology. So if you have a 10 times larger animal, you don't have 10 times more ener food consumption as energy for that animal. For its basal energy consumption, you have uh, the increase in mass to the three-quarter power. So, so you have a 10 times larger animal, you have about 5.6 times more energy consumption. And the same sort of quote unquote sublinear pattern in terms of if you double the size of an ant colony, you don't get double the energy consumption of the whole ant colony. The same kind of pattern holds. And so it kind of opens up lots of questions in your mind as to whether uh, <clears throat> the economy overall or all of us interacting with each other, we are an in that sense, a super organism when we're following the same pattern of energy consumption as we grow the economy. So it brings up questions of how many decisions mm -hmm. we're making independently of other information. Do we really have independent agency? Uh, what's the relationships between how the economy operates and how biological organisms would operate? And there's also something fairly interesting about very small organisms, like single cell organisms. So if you're a that relates to the scaling. If you're a bacteria and you have a 10 times larger bacteria, then they consume more than 10 times energy as they get 10 times bigger. Uh, so that's super linear scaling. If you're, that's a, what you would call a prokaryotes. If you're a eukaryotic single cell, which we're made out of eukaryotic cells, uh, like an amoeba or a paramecium, then you're roughly a linear relationship. 10 times larger eukaryotic cells, roughly a 10 times larger uh, energy consumption. And then once you have multi-cell organisms, and so we could argue we're a multi-cell organism that's a super organism in that sense, uh, the coordination physically of distributing blood through our and nutrients through our bodies and perhaps other kind of biochemical signals, uh, we have this sublinear scaling where a 10 times larger me uh, does not consume 10 times uh, more energy. So that's, in some sense, I, you know, we see that in the economic data, which is interesting. Uh, earlier economy, if you will, before the 1970s, is uh, linear scaling, kind of like an amoeba. And then after the 1970s, it's sublinear, like a multi-cell organism. Um, and so my modeling, uh, my economic modeling, didn't wasn't trying to prove or disprove this idea, but it ends up showing some of the same features. And the hypothesis is because I have uh, materials flowing to different parts of the economy, and they have to extract materials and convert them at some efficiency to produce an output, that, it's, that it has this similar structure, and so that that gives me some confidence or belief that, uh, okay, this kind of modeling is on the right track. So that's a long-winded answer, but the, the short answer is uh, we see similar patterns in relation to energy and size. It's, it's one of the simplest way to think about it. Steve, I know this is uh, right up your wheelhouse. What can you add on? You are speechless. He just doesn't. Speechless. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'd muted, I'd muted myself that time. Yeah, the same basic insight that Kerry has found, and this makes an enormous contrast with mainstream economics, which completely ignores the role of energy. So if you look at uh, the, the, the three squatter scaling that uh, uh, that Kerry is talking about, is something you can find in a book called Jeffrey uh, by Jeffrey West called Scale. Um, are you familiar with that one, Kerry? Yeah, it's back here. It's in the bookcase. Not a mouth. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> so, and, and he actually provides a mathematical basis for that. It's actually the three-quarter scaling is an effective way to get capillaries to distribute blood throughout a large organism. Um, so there's a, a reason for the three-quarter scaling in biological organisms. But in economic theory, they started with a... Uh, I mean, if you go back to the physiocrats, you get realism. But if you go past physiocrats and get Smith, you get unrealism in economics, and that's dominated all the way through. And modern neoclassical economics imagines you can produce output by combining what they call technology uh, times labor times capital. And the scaling factors they use for labor and capital are at 0.3 and 0.7 respectively, and they don't even incorporate energy. But when they do, they include the scaling factor as the um, proportion of energy as an industry in GDP, and that's of the order of 5% of GDP. So what they'll say is that there's a, a um, uh, if there's a 10% a fall in energy, you're going to get a 0.5% fall in energy, in GDP. Now that's sheer absolute nonsense. That never stops neoclassical economists from claiming something, of course, <laughs> um, but that's, that's their area. So what 
Kerry and I are trying to do, and uh, a number of other people, of course, including Bob Ayers, uh, are trying to do is bring energy and the biophysical nature of production into front and center where it should never have been removed uh, from economics as it was after the physiocrats and uh, and build a genuinely a, a economic theory that is built on the actual bio, biological and physical processes that we use to generate um, goods and services in a modern capitalist economy. So yeah, so what I, yeah, one of the things I, I think my takeaway is I've, I've, I've spoken with Jim Brown, who did a lot of the uh, work with uh, Jeffrey West, uh, leading up to Jeffrey West's book, uh, a lot of the mm. journal papers on this uh, biological, you know, metabolism type question. And the more you dive into other people discussing this, the more you, you know, get into uh, lots of different ideas and nuances about cold-blooded animals, warm-blooded animals, things, uh, organisms that aren't animals or insects or they're fish and all this kind of thing. So it definitely gets confusing. But my, uh, you know, I think my main takeaway is just sublinear scaling in general. Um, if you're, if you kind of have a social and or physical coordination, uh, I think one of the person who asked the question in the chat asked, a, what about saying that there's mutual interdependence of agency amongst the parts of an organism instead of, uh, I can't remember if I said independence, but I think in, the, the person uh, quoted interdependence. I think that's a fair way to talk about it. And uh, as soon as you seem to have some social interdependence and coordination or interaction or physical coordination amongst the parts, uh, you end up with uh, this sublinear scaling. And you can even see some research discussing tumors, uh, cancers. And uh, this is outside of my area, but uh, someone studying this was, was telling me that, oh yeah, cancer cells in some cases are essentially cells that no longer are getting the signals that they're part of a larger being. And so they grow as if they're just single cells. And so that's why they grow faster than the rest of uh, our cells is they've, they've lost these biogeochemical uh, signals that, that say that they're part of a larger cell. So if they can establish these chemical signals again, then the cells will realize they're part of another organism uh, and there's the cells right next to it. And then they'll, uh, they won't grow as fast. So if you have you know linear scaling in a body, that's a tumor. Uh, and uh, this is one of the ideas for trying to cure cancer. Mike, um, I know you, um, you know, Carrie, um, you, if, okay. So a little backstory. I heard about Carrie through Steve a few years ago. The first thing I watched, um, was his presentation with the econ chapter, um, SIG, we call them, um, with his model. I think you were, you were there. Um, tell me about that. That's you, Mike. <laughs> T tell you about the presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Summarize it. Summarize what you think about the the, the model. I guess we haven't really talked so, about it yet. Yeah, I don't. I can't remember all the details, but I'll, I'll, let me let me react to what I'm hearing here. Um, the work that Carrie is doing screams out for a complex systems approach which is not typically undertaken in, in economics, right? There's something that's known uh, among mathematicians, electrical engineers, and what have you as the superposition principle, which basically says you can take a complex linear dynamic system and break it into its component pieces, people or whatever the case may be, animals, firms, cars, whatever you're modeling, and determine the behavior of each of the individual pieces and then sum them up to get the behavior of the whole. The behavior of the whole is simply the sum of the behavior of the parts. So that's the superposition principle and that's, a, that's true of linear models. But as soon as we go nonlinear, like Kerry is, is talking about, and I know he talked about it in the presentation to the SIG and what have you, um, that no longer holds. You have to address, analyze the system as a whole, not just the behaviors of the parts, but how they interact with one another. And, and that's the key. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting with the cancer idea that, you know, a cancer cell, cell kind of goes rogue and isn't interacting with everybody else. <laughs> kind of an interesting uh, theory there. So, you know, the kinds of tools that 
you know, Steve is developing with Minsky and what have you are uh, well suited to these sorts of problems. Wow. I, right. I, I could say something because I have more of a, of a, of a question here. Uh, Mike, so um, from a mathematics standpoint and from an engineering standpoint, this um, sublinear that you're talking about, that's what Steve was referring to as like a three quarter coefficient or a two thirds coefficient. Is that, would that, do I have the, the, well, that's going, that's nonlinear, right? Yeah. That's the non, that's, that is the nonlinear. So I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, I believe that's what he's saying. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. The point, the point that, um, we're all making is that you, um, when you have a complex system, you have to analyze it as a system. And the whole point about complex is that there's feedbacks from one component to another. So the simplest one, if I use my, my, a lot of my work is based on Goodwin's growth cycle model. And part of that in a very simple Goodwin model, you have output, uh, you know, just, you know, the usual story economists use simple Y for output. And profit is defined as output minus wages, and wages are the wage rate multiplied by the number of workers with a job. Now, that gives you a nonlinearity. Wages multiplied by labor, where they're both variables, will give you a nonlinear behavior. And therefore, you can't analyze that by breaking it down into linear components and doing linear superposition on the other side. So that's, uh, whereas the neoclassicals, uh, a whole lot of what they do is, is making up ludicrous assumptions uh, that enable them to do linear supposition when it's not when it's not uh, desirable. So, for example, they will assume that wages are set in a perfectly competitive labour market, um, and in that perfectly competitive labour market, you get a horizontal line at the individual firm uh, when you work out their uh, their wage bill. So, their wage bill is literally the wage which doesn't change; therefore, it's taken as a constant by the firm, multiply the number of workers they hire. That eliminates the nonlinear and complex systems part of the behavior, and it's completely false. Um, so, if you have to do, if you actually want to analyze capitalism as it is, which is a complex superorganism, yeah, uh, to a fans saying, guess I'm feeling better, you're dead right compared to last Saturday. <laughs> um, if you want to analyze it as a, as a genuine system, you have to have everything varying at once. And this is the, in that, in that sense, for people who aren't familiar with uh, the complex systems approach or the system dynamics approach, or the approach that um, that Kerry has, has developed himself, which are all very compatible, um, is that we allow everything to vary at once, and it's good by ceteris paribus. And in that sense, the curse of economics, which comes from uh, um, Marshall, is this assumption of ceteris paribus, and let's eliminate this particular variable by assuming it doesn't change when we analyze the economy in this specific way. And we need, we need, desperately need to be able to analyze the system where everything's moving all at once. And that is what system dynamics enables you to do. Yeah, it's like a car. It's like a car going down the road and all of a sudden you're just throwing parts off and say, well, let's see if it keeps working. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah oh, pretty much that, hucking, yeah. You're just hucking stuff off, right? Um, who, the knows, who, needs oil? Is, who needs oil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I, I know Dan is the philosopher in the group. And so, you know, the, the idea uh, that Carrie is offering and Steve is offering really in the philosophical realm, I believe is methodological individualism, uh, or they're not that's advocating awesome. that, but that's the opposite, <laughs> that uh, what is society? Well, it's just the sum of the behavior of each of the individuals. Whereas the opposite, the sort of the system's point of view is that it also has, society is also the interaction of the individuals. They compete, they imitate, and and all sorts of things like that. And so what, what, what do you believe is kind of what society is or you know, the economy is. Right. I think one of the uh, persons in the chat referenced, uh, yeah, Michael Levin's work at Tufts. And yeah, that's the person I have uh, read up on who's, uh, you know, coming up with all kinds of uh, interesting ways to understand cells and cancer and treat these kinds of things. So that's a, a, a knowledgeable person here and uh, people on the show. Um, one of the we uh, we have the the smartest yeah. viewers on the yeah, planet yeah, yeah. that yeah, yeah I, come watch this I, show. Yeah, if you watch uh, videos of Michael Levin's talk, he's the he's probably the closest person to the old cartoon joke where someone's scientist is working on something and then the last thing that's heard is it works. Uh, he, uh, the things he's figuring <laughs> out are just kind of mind blowing uh, to me. So, uh, the, but one of the yeah one of the interesting things is. Uh, Mike is kind of pointing out, you know, a, a nonlinear system. You can get people use the term emergent properties in the in, in the chat. You you can get uh, outcomes that 
you know, you wouldn't predict from a linear or you can't predict from a linear system essentially. And in my, you know, published work on my model, which I'm, which is called the harmony model for human and resources with money model, which is essentially a combination of Steve's ideas, plus a, a biophysical, uh, simple biophysical model of an economy that where people have to rely on physical resources to survive. So it's just combining these two ideas is that it has a, uh, yeah, has a nonlinear feedback of once the resource starts getting extracted, you have to spend more and more, you have to spend a higher amount of resources to get the next bit of resource out. So that's not uncommon and, you know, even, you know, orthodox economics is sort of declining returns of extracting a resource. But essentially it's, um, it's, it's that feedback, you know, kind of start the model, the economy grows. And then once the resource gets depleted enough and you can no longer keep increasing at a higher rate, uh, at some point, the economy reaches a point where it, it goes to a steady state because it's currently modeled as a forest. So you can end up just extracting the forest, if you will, at the same rate you're consuming it. So it, it levels off. But in that leveling off and slowing down of growth to zero growth again to go to steady state, it's it's essentially the act of when it starts slowing that puts it into this sublinear regime or this uh, uh, relative decoupling regime in terms of relating energy to GDP. Uh, and that's the you know it's essentially the same exact pattern you see in the in the world economy when you look at the same data so it uh, so in the paper i wrote that this brings up the question of you know did do we go to relative decoupling consciously or on purpose or by design right like we we decided as a society we wanted to be more energy efficient or it's just it's just the pattern you would observe if you could no longer grow as fast again due to resource constraints this is just what's going to happen uh, and so i kind of brought that up and I don't know if there's, as far as I'm aware, there was no one else who kind of you know, stated it in that way or published that kind of result, but maybe it just becomes, you know, part of this other way of doing the macroeconomic modeling. I have a question for you guys. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm just pulling from what I, what I, I heard from Steve, I think a few episodes ago. Um, and I think there was a, a one-to-one -one relationship with, uh, GDP on a, on a, on a world scale and energy. Right. And so what I, my, my question is, is that it's kind of like all roads end to what, whether it's steady state or they, they end in this one, one-to-one -one relationship on the biggest macro scale, the biggest super organism that we can imagine. Right. And what Carrie's describing is that, and I think this, holds true for the place for complexity science and the models in your in your discipline are really in that space from zero to one because there's an infinite there's a there's a, there's an infinite difference between a zero and a one and what Carrie is explaining what I hear you explaining is that something interesting emerges happens at that zero to one transition either backing off of the one, going back to zero, it's effectively intervals and calculus. So it's like kind of getting to the core of something and then describing it with integrals and then modeling that behavior up to the one-to-one -one relationship, at least if we're talking about energy. And, uh, well, I'll say- Is that well, true? Uh, I'm not completely sure how to, uh, Think about what you said. I mean, I guess to some degree, yeah, it's 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 uh, <clears throat> calculus. So yeah, so what? Let's just say the relative decoupling is yeah, I can increase size as mass or GDP <clears throat> uh, by can at a rate that is slower than I increase energy consumption, and then absolute decoupling, <clears throat> which is what some people talk about to address you know climate change or reduce greenhouse gas emissions and green growth, if you will. We still want to grow the economy and decrease emissions. So absolute decoupling would be I can increase what I want, let's just say GDP or, uh, or output of some sort, uh, and decrease energy consumption. Absolutely. So we haven't proven we can do that. So that would be a you know a negative scaling past uh, zero. That energy uh, decreases with increasing mm -hmm. size, um, but we haven't. Or we, or we sort of clearly haven't seen that at the global scale. But as, as you're pointing out, there is this kind of seemingly transition in the in the global data around the 1970s, which we kind of all generally recognize as a time of uh, uh, sort of economic constraints geopolitically and physically. And there's 
arguments about how much it's geopolitical or not, but the fact of the matter is that the United States, largely Texas here, my, my home state, uh, was no longer able to produce uh, increasing amounts of oil, and so there was uh, the ability for geopolitical actors to change the global price of oil and, and kind of set us on a new regime. But I will point out one thing that I, in this sort of super organism context that I forgot to point out, this is also still in a paper that's in review, is that the industrial ecology community is starting to get pretty good at adding up all of the mass of stuff in the world. Uh, they've been tracking material flows and what it becomes. And there are estimates for the United States economy and estimates for the global economy. So if you, you know, the for an animal, we're looking at its mass. And then what I've stated so far is comparing mass to GDP. And, and GDP isn't the equivalent concept as mass of the economy. It's a, a measure of flow in the economy. So the regular biological scaling is a flow of energy to a stock of mass. Um, but now we have estimates of a stock of mass of the economy. And so it turns out you just get roughly, you, get, you still get the same patterns uh, that the the, the sort of Friedelin Kraussmann's group in, in, in Europe, that industrial ecology group, they've estimated how much stock of mass exists in the global economy. I don't know how accurate this is, probably plus or minus 50%, but <laughs> it is, uh, you know, not quite a thousand or not quite a teragram, I guess, of materials uh, on the planet. Uh, but if you plot energy consumption versus this mass accumulation of the global economy, you get the same pattern where it's almost linear until the 1970s and then starts to... Uh, become sublinear uh, after that. So just like uh, biological organisms. So the hypothesis is kind of that before the 1970s, yeah, we were integrated and there was trade uh, globally economies, but maybe it just wasn't the dominant feature. That uh, That's a hypothesis. I don't know if that can be treated that way. And then after the 1970s, become much more interdependent across the world. And so it became much more like a global superorganism rather than individual superorganisms that had trade and had connections, but it just wasn't maybe as dominant. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the uh, like button, subscribe, comment after the video. If you're over on Twitter, now known as X, make sure you like and repost there. Then come over here, join the chat. Um, we got um, a list to do. I want to just always give recognition to the group of viewers we always have i'm going to get steve to do it this week steve go ahead okay it's herb wiseman good day herb steve hinton hello steve and there's familiar names there jovi and r n stavros caragorgius hi grow slick simulacrum christopher dobby good day chris uh michael de souza cruz wwe fan 104 <laughs> drag eye james james ghost on the half shell tom roberts Thomas Zorge, JPG, JPJ, pardon me, David Branch, Political Economy 101, Dumbest in the Room podcast. I have to go on that one of these days. <laughs> Liori, TR, and a lost adult. That sounds like me as well. I have a yeah. French Lee yeah. Miserable fan, perhaps, there. I don't know. <laughs> J. <laughs> Jean Valjean. Yep. <laughs> yeah, on, on the stats that you were mentioning earlier, Dan. Um, the work that I'm doing is fundamentally trying to integrate energy into production. So the fundamental argument I made was that labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. So energy is not an independent input into production. It is an input to labor and capital without which they can do no work. And then uh, to that then gives you two rival production functions. And Kerry, I've got to ask you about this as well in a moment. Two rival production functions dom that dominate economics. Neoclassicals use this idea of a Cobb-Douglas production function. And when I make that change into the Cobb-Douglas production function, then I get uh, what they call technology ends up being the, uh, the, the energy output of the representative machine of a particular time. So a technology is not strictly uh, a residual as they make it in their own empirical estimations. It's the energy uh, capacity of the representative machine the given time but they drastically underestimate the point of energy even then so you get a car they get a, a coefficient of 0.3 and that basically says a 10 percent increase in energy will cause a three percent increase in gdp no it'll cause a lot more than that um but the other production function is the, the one that was used empirically by post keynesians called the leontia production function and that relates output so to say to, to machinery and saying output is equal to machinery which they use k for 
uh, divided by a capital output ratio. Now, when I go through and look at the logic of this um, argument that energy is an input to labour and capital, what we call the um, uh, labour capital uh, capital output ratio ends up being the efficiency with which machines turn energy into useful work. So that's, um, and then when I look at it empirically, and this, I'm using data from 1960 to about 2020. And so this is data that overlaps the period where, where, where Kerry is talking about an actual change in the relationship. But you get a very, very tight correlation between energy and GDP. I, I have, it, it's a 0.997 correlation, which is off the scale. Um, but that, of course, involves in increasing values. But what Kerry is talking about is a, a sublinear. You, you then have a, a, a you, when you look at the rate of change of energy and the rate of change of uh, GDP, I get a correlation of either point, uh, you know, one unit of energy to 0.8 of GDP or 0.1.2 of GDP, depending on where you put your, your correlation slope through. So even though there's been a change in the relationship around 1970, it's still very much the case that GDP is fundamentally energy transformed into useful work. And that's what distinguishes my work and Carey's work um, from the majority, not just of neoclassical economists who are a waste of time uh, and energy, but uh, also from our own post-Keynesian colleagues who haven't as yet become as conscious of the role of energy in production. This is, Mike, just, uh, this is fascinating. And I want to just, I want to, I want to say, I'd like to bridge the two of those because I, you know, with Steve's comment, um, I'm trying to put this together, right? And I'm hoping the audience also is in a similar position to me. Where is it, could you put one research above another? Could you, um, that sounds silly, but is there a hierarchy to this knowledge that you have? Would, Actually, I'll, I'll get I'll get um, we had a hand wave there from Mike, so I'll get Mike to throw yeah. his five cents worth in first of all before I carry on with that question. Yeah, I might clarify something too, but Mike can go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed uh, Sherry Wise uh, asked a question about how economists relate what they do to to politics, right? Sort of the political economy and how it relates to political systems and what have you. And I thought that was a, is a great question. So if you take a complex systems analysis point of view, if you use the, the, the tools and perspective of complex systems analysis, uh, among the things you worry about, think about, model, are feedback relationships, feedback loops, and nonlinear relationships. And we've kind of mentioned that. So when you have feedback, complex feedback systems, they tend to have uh, two features that make it very difficult to change the direction of a system. The negative loops are like thermostats. They try and keep the temperature at, a, at the setting, right? So, so you throw the door open and, and hot air or cold air comes in, depending winter, summer, and the, the furnace or the air conditioning kicks on and it brings the system back to where it was. It tries to hold the system where it's at. So negative loops when policy changes are tried and they shove the system they bring the system back to where it was right or positive loops self-reinforcing process can make the system path dependent and lock it in to a particular path so the question is in light of this how do you change a system a complex feedback system make it do what you want well you need leverage points right this is where a little bit of of effort time money whatever gets you a you know, get you a, a significant result. And then often those uh, leverage points are located in counterintuitive places. So that's why you need tools such as Minsky to help you identify where the leverage points are. And then where do you push? You push the system this way or this way, and that's often counterintuitive. And what usually happens is this, and this gets to the political thing that Sherry was interested in. We find that with complex systems, when you find a leverage point, um, you get either worse before better or better before worse behavior. So if you push the wrong way, yeah, you get what you want in the short run, but then it goes back to where it was or even worse. Mm. But you can push the other way with a policy and it'll get worse first in the short run, but then it gets better in the long run. But the politicians in democracies, they, they have what, two-year congressional cycles, corporations have quarterly earnings reports, share prices, whatever. So they worry about the short run. 
So they'll pick the policy that gets, you know, better before worse, rather worse before better, right? The other thing uh, with this nonlinear thing is you can get, and the feedback loops, is you get shifting feedback loop dominance with nonlinear systems. And what that means, a system can go be going along like this, and suddenly it can go like that, a, an abrupt change. So let's take the, the, the issue of climate change. A lot of people will argue that, well, the planet is gradually warming over a 100-year time frame. We can adapt. That's true, except if you get in, you see catastrophe theory, Renee Tom's work, where you hit or an inflection point, uh, you get these abrupt changes. That's the risk you run, that you'll, you'll hit a shifting feedback loops and a, a powerful positive loop will kick in and just rip the system down and there's not enough time to adapt. So that's, again, why these tools such as Minsky are quite important to analyze these problems from a complex systems perspective. And, of course, Kerry is, is, is doing that as well. Mike, I've, I've got a question um, with the shifting dominance. Is this similar to in Steve's Minsky model? Um, everybody knows it kind of goes into the period of moderation and then it breaks down. Is that is that similar or is that something? Yeah, absolutely. The simplest case I can give you is S-shaped growth, logistic growth, like a product lifestyle, grows exponentially a positive loop. Then there's a shift in feedback loop dominance, and then it goes into negative loop behavior. That's the simplest case. But absolutely, the Steve's Minsky, famous Minsky model, absolutely, that shifting feedback loop dominance. Yep. Right. right. So back to these different <clears throat> kind of ways to think about energy. There was actually had a discussion with, I'll say, a former... Uh, executive or chief scientist of a large energy company uh, this uh, <clears throat> last week who was on our on our campus and I was sort of explaining some of these ideas we're discussing here about energy relates to size of the economy and these kinds of things and he he liked when I used terms related to thermodynamics uh, he did he got confused on why we would use a term like biophysical and these kinds of things so I kind of got me thinking as to, you know, how to introduce these ideas to people because he was a, you know, a technical person. So thinking about thermodynamics and, and terms in relation to energy was, was normal for him. But what I introduced to him to something that uh, Steve was, was hinting at is that the, some of the work from uh, Benjamin War and who was working with Bob Ayers at the time were not, you know, there's, there's kind of three stages at which some of us think about uh, uh, energy in terms of the supply chain or the conversion chain of energy there's primary energy which is the quantity of energy uh, a quantity we we calculate to estimate the energy we extract from the environment before we do anything else with it it's just the quantity of what we get from the environment or the rate then there's a final energy which is like energy carriers things we've con we've converted primary energy into uh, energy carriers that we then uh, put into our machines directly for fuel that'd be gasoline electricity diesel fuel refined things that have very specific properties. And then there is the useful work, which Steve hinted at, which is, okay, you put the fuel into the machine and the machine is converting at some efficiency the energy content of this fuel into actual mechanical work or light, uh, the, the, the radiation output of lighting, uh, the mechanical drive of motors and engines, uh, could be even the muscle work of humans when you look back uh, long enough. So this physical work, which is also has units of energy, that is what seems to have a one-to-one -one relationship with GDP. And so it implies, you know, a lot of us in one of the conferences I went to this summer in, in France was this Exergy Economics Group that focuses a lot on this idea and trying to promote, uh, you know, data sets and, and additional ways to, to, to be able to calculate this and how we might incorporate it uh, into our models in general is, is to think about this useful work or if you get really nerdy, you would, you would just call it useful Exergy because um, it's still uh, uh, maybe not the final work product done. That's a kind of philosophical concept. What's the final work done? Arranging the, the, the soil into a big pile so I can stick the, you know, the, the, the plant seed in it, or is it the work of the tractor? These it's guys all are, dirt. It's all dirt. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all it's dirt all That's the way the down. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this useful work seems much more one-to-one -one with gross domestic product than primary energy. And so most people are looking at primary energy, uh, but once you account for efficiencies, which is how we put our knowledge to work into machines, we embody this uh, and in one way we can measure our knowledge is how we embody that knowledge into the efficiency of conversion of energy. So once we take that those ideas into account, we end up with a much more linear 
relationship between energy and uh, work in this case, and GDP rather than primary energy, which doesn't even have a standard accounting framework, right? Primary energy, when we count it, uh, you know, there are, there are at least three uh, major conventions for how to estimate what that quantity is. So that's a little bit more ambiguous, but the useful exergy is much less ambiguous, which makes it a, a target uh, um, for understanding energy and uh, technology and GDP relationships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For everybody, well, how predictive do you guys, would you guys say the discipline is right now of com complexity uh, science? That's a broad question. I let one <laughs> other. You might say in relation what? to economics or something, yeah. Uh, what are you trying to yeah. predict? Yeah. In, 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 uh, in, economics is, uh, this is what I think I'd argue, economic theory is anti-complexity. It's anti-evolutionary. And that's one reason why it's been such a struggle to try to bring this stuff in. Because if you believe the economy heads towards an equilibrium, uh, then once you hit equilibrium, why change? So there's an, a non-evolutionary foundation to how neoclassicals think about the economy. And that is what's blocking them understanding the sort of stuff that we're trying to develop here. And it makes them simply, they simply the only way they can understand it is to stop being neoclassical economists. And that's why it's so hard to get progress in economics. So if you look at the theory of the Marshallian firm, for example, and Marshall uh, you know, basically drew two lines on a diagram, supply and demand, and said there's going to be rising supply cost uh, without having any, any empirical assumption for it. When neoclassicals built a theory as to why there is rising supply cost, which is empirically false, uh, what it meant was that the firm gets to a certain size, any larger than that, it's going to lose money. Uh, so there's no evolutionary advantage for a firm to getting larger. But if you look in the real world where marginal cost is falling and as you increase output, you get more profit uh, because your cost of production actually falls. So producing a larger amount, uh, you're amortizing a fixed capital over a larger number of units and you have a constant or falling variable cost as well. So you get a double whammy in your favor. If you get larger, you can invest more and you can grow more. And there's a strong evolutionary um advantage for you in terms of size. Equally, at the other end of the scale, where you have small firms, the small firms know that the only way they can compete, they can't compete on scale, uh, and they can't compete on cost of production, they've got to innovate. So you get technological innovation and product innovation at the small end of an industry, and then size and investment innovation at the large end. And that's what gives you the real dynamics of capitalism. Now that you can never get into neoclassicals because they hang on to this ridiculous idea of rising marginal cost and therefore an ideal size for a firm and so on. And therefore they're anti-evolutionary, anti-complexity, and that's why we can't get the bastards to think sensibly. I can say that one of the... Uh... One of the last uh, pr pr proposals I wrote, there were, you know, I think five reviewers, and they all have a say what they want. Now, one of them was a self-proclaimed economist. Uh, he or she stated that in the review, and um, this person was the only one to give us the highest rating. And the, the rationale was, you know what? They're actually trying something different here. They're actually trying something that can address the issues uh, that are in orthodox economics. They were saying, it was like, I'm not 100% sure it's going to work, but that's what research is. And this is exactly the kind of research you should be funding. He was like, they're, they're actually trying something new and I can see how it's new. And the other people were kind of like, well, it was a multidisciplinary kind of review panel. So they might not have, probably not economists, I don't know. But the rest of them were not completely sure <laughs> what Steve, we were talking about. Get a paper that's in there. That's one rare economist. We need to find that one and yeah, reproduce yeah, I don't know who it was. I, I may never know. I probably okay. never that's know. an economist that we need to breed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, in terms of uh, answering Dan's questions, in terms of predicting something, um, it's, it's kind of like predicting what? If if you say, can uh, economists predict the future, the unemployment rate, the GDP, or, you know, or what have you, or let's take something more of us can relate to, perhaps the weather. I'll predict the weather one second from, from now will be exactly as it is now. I have a window right here above. Oh, I was right. I should be a meteorologist. Well, no, I mean, it's it, yes, the momentum of any system, you know, in a short run time frame is not going to really change much. So it's easy to predict. But if you're trying to predict out to a useful um, point in the future, so the weather example, I'm a farmer and I want to know what kind of crop I should produce, you know, next year, a, 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 a crop that thrives in a wetter 
planting growing season or a drier growing, it's not going to help. Now I can't. My predictions aren't going to be good unless I have some magic crystal ball. Same thing with predicting stock prices or, or what, what have you. What we are good at predicting, though, if you take a complex systems approach using Minsky or Stella or something like that, are the implications of your own understanding of something, your own mental model that you've made explicit and often you're surprised when the computer mercilessly traces through your knowledge base or a mm -hmm. combined consensus knowledge base. It's good at predicting the, impl uh, the um, implications of a policy change. Well, I think if I raise taxes, the following will happen. We'll try it on the model. And often with these feedback loops and stuff, you find out mm -hmm. that it didn't, uh, the, the implications are not what you thought or they are, but they're very weak. You don't get a big, uh, a, a, a big um, a bang for the buck. And really the model, our models are good for redesigning our institutions, redesigning the system, redesigning the airplane. The airplane isn't flying very well. We want it to fly higher, faster, more fuel efficiently, carry more cargo or whatever. Um, how can we redesign it in order to improve its performance? Perhaps not make it perfect, but make it better, right? And, mm -hmm. and our models are, 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 are good for that. So, uh, you know, anybody who says they, they can forecast, you know, that, that, that my, 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 my uh, record is whatever. It's like, if that's true, why would you tell anyone? <laughs> You can make a lot more money by speculating without telling anyone. Uh, it's you know it's it's nonsense. It can be an interesting uh, conversation piece to to yeah. pre predict way out and say you know what are the implications without changing anything. Let's have a conversation. But the idea that you're going to hit a number out in the future, way out in the future, something is no. Is I really like this idea of <clears throat> levers and inflection points. I like that levers and inflection points, Mike. I think that's that's really good. Yeah. That um, it seems to me like it's um, in 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 the in the field and study of economics, it's actually improving the discipline, right? It's 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 making it could. <laughs> well, that you struggle the, you struggle to make it any worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen, I have I have a recommendation to to three econ. Are you an economist, Kerry? Uh, I don't uh, I don't know. I suppose I'm a you know. Uh, economist, engineer, or I'll just say scientist. I don't, I don't know. I'll just stick what with was that. Your back, what was your training, Gary? We haven't actually mentioned uh, this before. Huh? Yeah, degrees are engin degree engineering, in. mechanical engineering. And I did sort of, you know, dynamic systems modeling, uh, not in sort of the sense we're speaking here, but a lot more of a pure uh, engineering type uh, modeling, dynamic systems and control. So that's what, that's what I learned as a, as a graduate student. Yep. Yeah, Not you, hear, social sense. you hear feedback loop and you know exactly what that means. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all feedbacks. <laughs> well, positive and negative. I like the differentiation, Mike, right? One, it's one they, they that's mean one very words, different things. That's one set of words that actually like us to change, by the way, because positive to most people means good and negative means bad. Yes. And this is one of the yeah. pages where, where you know, normal terminology gets in the way of understanding what we're talking about. I'd rather say amplifying and dampening. Yeah, uh, I think so our, our balance, 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 balance. Yeah, yeah, balance. yeah, yeah. The yeah, balance. Are balancing is well. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> okay. I, I was so excited. Amplifying the amplifying and, and damping. Replace, and, yeah. and replace positive with amplifying and replace negative with dampening. And then we're actually using language people understand. Yeah, we and I said we sometimes say reinforcing or balancing in system dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think balancing. Well, let's do it. Wait a minute, you guys stop it. Stop it. We gotta decide. Things, you know, <laughs> up we gotta decide side. here and now, okay? All right. Because here's the problem: you put a you're 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 bifurcating the whole wisdom of Steve Keen here. I, oh, and Mike, we'll put him on equal play, okay? But okay, look, here's this thing. E.O. Wilson came up with this uh, idea of a culture gen, right? Culture gen, G-E-N. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's also you've heard of Dawkins' meme right? Which one um, made it into public consciousness? Well, Dawkins' is meme is, right? And it's, yeah. got, it's got some negative, um, not connotations, but it's not ideal in terms of describing basically how culture replicates, right? Okay. I mean, yeah. meme for yeah. obvious reasons, right? So, so I want to set the stage, right? I'm going to set the stage. Let's decide here and now what what we're going to refer to and let's stick to it you, you, you silly bunch you of liberals 
You can't, you can't. So, and the reason why there's different terminology is because different um, fields use different engineers use, I believe, positive and negative. Um, system dynamics really focuses on balancing and, um, geez, reinforcing. reinforcing. Um, and then what, Steve, what was your suggestion? Mine is, is amplifying and dampening. <laughs> And my, was Mike? Did I have another one? I, I think there was. One, I think the healthcare, the healthcare industry. When I watch some of the um, healthcare system dynamic um, special interest groups, they might have um, a different one too, but I can't remember. So just to just to jump in, so um, we, we use in economics, and I was taught in system dynamics stocks and flows. Okay, Forrester, the inventor of system dynamics, never said stocks and flows. He said rates and levels. Levels, yeah. And and engineers yeah. often call stocks or levels state variables. Mm -hmm. So well, this is the yeah. problem, you guys. This is and then the and, and and health and health stocks are compartments and flows are incidents. Yeah. So depending <laughs> on the field, yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. But at least you think something which it doesn't get misinterpreted by ordinary readers and negative and positive yeah. to me it's just too simple to yeah, end up yeah. being misinterpreted other all the other terms we put forward have got at least there's some way in which an ordinary person like a non-specialist hearing that has some idea what you're talking about and that helps immensely yeah, yeah. Steve, i think it's absolutely awful. right it's a very common interpretation of positive loops mean means good for example absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Cancer, for example, cancer is a positive feedback isn't that great yeah yeah yeah, in yeah. the class, yeah, you make make sure to to uh, clarify what these terms mean. But I think a lot of it is whether you're doing the mathematics, positive and negative can mean something to you because you're doing mathematics. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Yeah, uh, and then yeah. if you're just talking and about words, then uh, you know yeah. balancing and reinforcing uh, makes sense. We're, we were not going to value world and positive and negative makes that perfect sense. But uh, most people don't know what the hell we're talking about. We talk about an eigen value. Right. Mm. Very interesting. Okay, well, we're almost at the top of the hour here. Yeah, we're gonna do so, we're gonna do some news next. So let's do some news. The M2 money supply has been shrinking in the United States. Now, I got this story actually from our good friend, Ed, the Douglas, the MMT macro trader. Um, he did a video on it. He's got a graph. We'll show that in a second. But basically, he summarized that the M2 money supply has been contracting. And this is concerning to many traders. He's a trader. So from that perspective. But MMT explains um, why MMT is not the whole picture. Government spending is effectively left out of MT, M2 and as a causal variable to markets, this is important. I'll bring up the graph and I'll get Steve to kind of comment on this first because Douglas is actually really like Steve's work where Steve has always really focused on the private sector and unifying that with uh, the government sector. This is an interesting graph where it's showing the acceleration of the deficit and the acceleration and deceleration of M2. Any thoughts on this, Steve? Um, you know, is M2, when uh, the mainstream uh, looks at M2 uh, an awful lot, but are they missing something when they just look at M2 and decide, okay, this is the way the economy is going to go over the next quarter? Um, actually, I think Douglas has identified something important here uh, because M2 is fundamentally driven by credit dynamics. And what's been going on for, uh, for, for some time, of course, is rising interest rates driven by the Federal Reserve's neoclassical theory about how you control the rate of inflation. And you would have seen Warren Mosler making a lot of comments uh, uh, about the increase in in interest rates actually increasing income in the economy because you have to pay this higher interest rate on new bonds and therefore banks and non and financial institutions that are buying those bonds 
uh, right, where they used to get a 0% yield, they're now getting a 5% yield, and that 5% yield times the value of the bonds they're buying is actually cash that turns up in their accounts. So you get a boost to the money supply coming out of that. Now, what I've been waiting for is that as you increase the interest rate, you also make it less desirable for uh, ordinary uh, for, for, for mortgage buyers or for house buyers and for firms to borrow money to either buy a house or to, or to invest. And as that rate rises, you're likely to see lower credit demand and quite possibly credit going negative. Uh, and so, um, and that's what I think is happening here. Uh, we're finally seeing a negative growth of M2. And that implies you've now got negative credit demand. And that would mean quite a substantial reduction in the rate of growth of the economy. So this could be a, a very powerful signal that Douglas has identified. Unfortunately, I, I tend be, because I've been working so hard on developing Ravel, my software package, uh, I haven't developed my database because I don't have a, you know, Gravel's still being gotten to the point where it can actually bring together and integrate that, uh, data of different time frequencies. And so I'm tend to be using a Bank of International Settlements database, and that's running at least nine months behind where the data is right now. But what is being shown by Douglas's data there, which I presume is up to the monthly level, uh, is a decline in the rate of growth of M2, which would be caused by credit going from positive to negative, and that can imply serious negative consequences in the genuine sense of the word for the economy in the near future. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I watched his um, episode. I just, I, I really like um, how he's focusing on both flows, the physical flows and the credit flows. I think it's important to not just look at one or the other i'm on the side that this is alarming if we look at the canadian data right now we actually are in negative gdp for this quarter the numbers just came out this past week uh, our negative uh, our credit has gone negative as well um it, it's some pretty big signals here that we are we are in in the midst of a slowdown um so carrie i know this is a little bit outside of your wheelhouse but any thoughts uh, yeah, uh, I think it's yeah. I don't focus on these kinds of things as, as much, and I hope to have my uh, you know modeling of the U.S. economy working so I can have something to say on this and say maybe a year's time. But yeah, I, th I think we're still, from what I understand, in a little bit of a some timing of some tail offs of COVID related uh, spending and uh, kind of benefits uh, going away for health, child health care and some student loan payments, uh, interest payments being. Uh, held back and now those are starting to be paid off so or ha have to start being paid uh so yeah i think this is some time when some of these uh, uh the stimulus spending if you will related to covid's tailing off <clears throat> so at least from the government side of spending so we're yeah this is uh, we're gonna see how, how it pans out yeah i don't have a lot of ec extra insights because there was such a jump but i know that uh you know a lot of mmtiers were in some sense, you know, always telling people who want to poo-poo the M M MMT idea that, you know, this is not the kind of spending that we would advocate, at least some of the COVID stuff, because it was just kind of given out without a particular purpose. But the uh, sort of Biden-level administration uh, stimulus for renewable energy and uh, uh, some 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 low-carbon investments is a little bit more targeted, and we'll just have to see how, how that pans out. There's mostly tax credits. Uh, uh, and some incentives to build new infrastructure. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess is yeah, we'll still have to have uh, several years to see how that pans out. Dan, any thoughts on that graph you saw? I know again, this is outside of your wheelhouse, but I'll bring it back up, and maybe you can, uh, you know, for the average typical Canadian philosopher, what's your thoughts? <laughs> oh, sorry, I got you muted. Oh, I'm, I'm muted really now. I really like this part of the show because I really enjoyed um, seeing Steve kind of break this down. Um, the layman person, philosophy aside, looking at this, um, it, it the only thing I know about M2 is that it's some sort of like um, grouping of like cash and checks and money and like how much available cash or financial. M M2. Is M2 actually it does actually vary in a few different countries, but you can generalize it by deposits 
in bank accounts and physical cash in the private sector circulating. Right, and right. M1, so, yeah. M yeah. M1 is fundamentally check accounts. So this is including savings accounts as well. And of course, in the modern world, virtually all of us use what we would have called saving accounts in the past. And what you've got happening in terms of money creation is that both the government and the private sector can create money. The government creates money by running a deficit, which I prefer to call theat. The uh, private sector creates money by creating new loans. So what you had you, during COVID, you had a dramatic increase in the money supply because of the huge scale of the government deficit at the time. Uh, and at the same point, to some extent, the private sector going the opposite direction, but it was swamped by the scale of government spending. Uh, then you had the decline, and that shows up in the graph as well, the, the fall in the size of the fiscal deficit, that which the, the red, the solid red bars there, going from positive to negative for a short while, now back again to of the order of the 8% of GDP. And that's the point that um, uh, Warren Mosler focused on and said that's actually quite stimulatory. But we're, if we're now seeing the two graphs going in the opposite direction, that to me implies the role of the credit side of things is actually contractionary. So we've got a private sector contraction going on while the government is countering it to some degree with fiscal stimulus. So, uh, and in the terms of the scale of the two, it looks like the private sector is winning. And that's likely to mean a fall in assets which are bought using borrowed money. And that is fundamentally shares, and of course also mainly, uh, house prices. So we should be seeing a fall in house prices coming out of this. And that itself could have feed through effects on the rest of the economy. Uh, because so many people are going to be, if they're unable to, to uh, maintain their mortgage, then they're going to be spending a damn sight little elsewhere in the economy as well. Mm. Yeah, and we got to look also that deficit spending you're seeing is a great deal of it is it, it, the interest flow. And it's questionable how that money, uh, we use the term trickle down economics, how that really trickles down into consumption in the private sector or if it's just driven because the, the the people earning that interest income is basically banks and very rich people. Do they just turn around and drive it into financial assets, which is just going to create a bubble in that department and not even be counted in GDP? Just thought it was an interesting thing. I, I told Douglas mm. I'd bring it up on the show because I, I like he really does a lot of work, you know, trying to find correlations and causations and things of this nature i think the next story is kind of dovetails into it and that is jobs down in the united states job creation in the united states has slowed more than expected in august according to the adp a sign that the surprisingly resilient u.s economy might be starting to ease under pressures from higher interest rates the firm reported wednesday that private employers added uh, 177,000 jobs in august well below the revised total of 371,000 added in July. Economists service by the, surveyed by the Dow Jones were expecting 200,000 jobs added in August. I think this just really uh, um, amplifies the fact that we are seeing the effects of higher interest rates in the private sector. And S Steve, can you add any thoughts? I know this is an American piece of data and you're not in America, yeah. but just add add some context to it. Well, again, the, the, the Federal Reserve thinks it controls the economy by fine-tuning the interest rate and therefore changing our desire to, con to consume now. That's, that's the idea. I think they call it the Engel equation, which is an insult to a great mathematician. Um, but nonetheless, that's their, that's their perspective. What actually they do when they slow the economy down by putting up interest rates is by crushing credit creation which they don't even include in their models. Uh, one reason they're so bloody infuriating, they leave out the major causal factors. But if you then have this level of interest rates cutting back on credit creation, there's less aggregate demand than aggregate income in the economy, and you can have a recession coming out of it. So this, this, the, the, the recession, this would be a, a, a government caused recession caused by the Federal Reserve, uh, but manifest in a collapse in private money creation which is created by the private banks. Um, so, yeah, I think putting the two together, I'd be expecting a slowdown, not necessarily a, a recession because the scale of government spending in the opposite direction is still quite high. So, but certainly the, it looks like the private sector's contribution is finally turning up 
and it's negative and it's potentially bigger than what the government is putting in there. Right. Now, Carrie, again, I know this one's outside of your wheelhouse, but here's my thought, and maybe you can chime in on this. Do you think, because this was a supply issue, you know, our last bout of inflation, that really it, it, we could have left interest rates really low and inflation would have done its thing, been long-term transitory, if you want to call that, and just return back down to a normal level? What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts are, I, I wish I could understand this <clears throat> more, and yeah, and I haven't been able to think about it as, as much as I'd like, focused on sort of... Uh, you know, structure and collecting data in the mathematical framework of my modeling. But yeah, the goal would be to try to understand these kinds of uh, influences um, or what the <clears throat> what the influence of the rate of inflation is on growth in relation to uh, resource constraints. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing, you know, everybody thinking about this, uh, <clears throat> as you said, on whether, yeah, if the interest rates kind of didn't matter. I, I feel like I have a slight understanding of why someone like Mosler would say the you know the natural rate of interest is zero. Uh, these kinds of ideas, um, but you know the one in thinking about the jobs data, you know they say how many jobs are created. And I guess this is a I don't know it's, a, it's this data is a net job creation or just created minus those that uh, went away. But you know the <clears throat> in my model one of the things I I track or, or will try to mimic or relate to the real world data is the you know labor force participation rate right what percentage of people are actually working and uh you know that that peaked out in the you know in the 2000s and has been going down at least for the united states hasn't gone down that much and so people you know if you're a, someone who thinks we need more workers and more population then you you, you know you kind of might go there but i look at this as just another example of you know a long-term negative or uh, balancing feedback if you will, on uh, on growth, and that uh, one of the things you would expect to, when there's uh, growth constraints is you would expect the stock or the population of a stock of either capital or people, in this case, to get older over time. And as it gets older over time, you will end up uh, kind of reaching out a maximum uh, proportion of those people that are working because you'll get an aging population. So I don't see these things as uh, in the long term as a uh, you know needing job creation. To, to put an aging population to work, it means maybe you're starting to put, telling older people that they have to keep working so that you can have job creation if you have an aging population. That's not necessarily a well-being indicator or a, a great situation. Um, I think it's maybe fighting, you know, fighting the direction of the long-term trajectory of the economy where we should expect the population to get older. We should expect it to be harder to keep the same proportion of people working over time. And we just have to try to uh, adjust to that. Uh, the best we can. Yeah, my uh, thoughts, my thoughts really that uh, it's just fuckery when the, the CB messes around with interest rates. If you model it just using a basic Goodwin model or Steve Keen's uh, model, um, it's endogenous behavior inflation, right? The the battle between firms and or profits and wages. Um, depending on where you adjust interest rates in that cycle, you can actually cause instability and you don't know what's going to happen because the economy is a complex uh, system. So when when uh, the central bank and the economists at the central bank are, are swapping around interest rates, they really don't know what's going to happen from a complex system perspective. They have thoughts on what, what should happen. Um, so my my thought is, Really, if you you, you are going to have interest rates, and I know MMTers might get mad at me when I say this, but just let the private market decide them, right? Banks, banks are going to mark up interest rates according to the price of currency de devaluing over time, right? That's going to be their perspective. Uh, you know, the fundamental interest rate of interbank lending, right? That's uh, can be decided on how, how much settlement balances are in uh, on account with the central bank. And if it's so, if there's so much of it right now, then it's zero percent, and it is what it is. And banks will mark up a fee to their customers, and we kind of let the market decide that. But that might be a little controversial in itself. Daniel, what are you thinking? I know this is a lot of psycho, psycho technical talk for you. What's your thoughts? No, I was almost going to prompt put put Steve on the position plate here again uh, because. Um, let, let's say there's a game, okay? And the game is, it's called the Fed, 
all right? And uh, yeah. you're invited to play this game and you can only use the rules that, uh, you know, the neoclassical rules basically, right? But they're saying, Steve, please tell us what and how we should adjust the interest rates. You know the game, that's what it is. These are the mechanisms that we have to kind of mm, mm. steer the ship. And they're saying, um, it, you're, you're in charge of making um, the decision in Canada, say. Or, no, let's use the United States. You're, you're in charge of making the decision in the United States. And so what would you have done? Uh, would you have raised interest rates? Would you have more in line with what Ty was explaining? Just kind of leave them and just let them sort of, um, you know, run its course, sort of thing. What, what would what you, would you have done? I um, like there's a there's a strong MMT argument that they call the natural rate of interest is zero. I actually think that's institutionally wrong uh, because. If you look at what banks do, banks make money out of interest and they make interest in two possible ways. They can charge interest on loans or they can get paid interest on bonds. And if you have banks being paid zero interest on the bonds that they hold from treasury bonds, then that's a fairly strong encouragement to go out there and create uh, lending bubbles because that way they can get the private sector to borrow money and pay interest to them in that sense. And I actually think that driving the rate of interest too low uh, on bonds ends up leading to the banks trying to entice us into more borrowing of money for asset bubbles. And that's a huge part of the negative nature in the normal sense of the word, negative nature of modern capitalism. It's all focused on asset price speculation rather than actual productive investment. So I'd rather have a, a rate of interest on bonds of the order of two or three percent uh, which if you look at the old cliche about what banks are, they used to be described, and I wish they still were, <laughs> as 363 businesses. Charge, you, you, you pay pay 3%, which is not true. They get 3% on bonds. So I'll put it that way. Get 3% on bonds, charge 6% on loans, and be on the golf course by six by 3 p.m. Oh yeah. We're a much healthier world if that's what they were doing, and they're a damn sight less of them as well uh, than we have at the moment. So that's my preferred overall outcome. So I wouldn't be using the interest rate to vary uh, 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 aggregate demand. I'd be saying if you want to vary aggregate demand, then you vary fiscal policy, because that has a direct impact upon the level of demand in the economy. And I would, if, if I'd be doing anything, I'd be saying, well, what you can do is target who you sell bonds to. Because if you sell bonds to the non-bank uh, financial sector, you're taking money out of circulation. And you're therefore encouraging people not to spend because you've taken money out of their bank accounts. And then you, what you're instead giving them is a rate of return on the bonds they own. So I'd rather, rather than use, if I had to be stuck with using the tools of the Federal Reserve, I'd rather be varying the bond selling and buying behavior of the banks and using that to change the amount of money in the economy and change demand that way rather than changing the interest rate. Interesting. Fascinating. Let me ask a... Uh, I mean, sort of a question to Steve as well. Does it matter sort of, it seems perhaps the history of how interest rates have changed. I don't know how far back, you know, you have to go five, 10, 15 years, but, you know, for, since the 1980s, uh, sort of Paul Volcker and coming out of the 1970s oil crises, you know, interest rates sort of, you know, there were fluctuations, but sort of on a decline after the great financial crisis all the way to zero. And as far as looking at the history of interest rates, which i put in my book, you know, that is a, is a relative, is a, is a quite unique phenomenon to mm. decline for several decades and then actually to get near zero, at least in terms of central bank interest rates. So coming back from zero to a positive number is maybe kind of a really an unprecedented situation in the world. Outside of world wars, I think maybe they, they, they said them uh, maybe changed. Yeah, I think that's, wars, but. I, I think that's quite true. It is unprecedented. And like one thing I find, uh, quite fascinating is that decades ago, I wish I hadn't sold, I gave it to a student, never got the bloody book back, a brilliant book by a statistician called Ehrenberg, and the book was called Data Reduction. And it's, it was really saying what you use, you use statistics to reduce data to information. It was very, very well argued. I used it to teach statistics to the Department of Agriculture in New South Wales and a few other places. I thought it was fabulous. Anyway, the reason I mention it is because his example of a parameter that doesn't change was the rate of interest. And if you take a look over the historical term, he's writing in the 1930s, you go back to the 1800s, 
fundamentally, interest rates on bonds were fairly constant. And what that meant was the, the upper class in England, with, we're going back now, we're going to the 19th century, going back to the, the Jane Eyre uh, period of, of humanity, um, the attractiveness of a, of a potential male suitor was reflected by how many bonds, as with land and bonds that he owned, and the bonds were yielding 3%. And that was um, and, and and that was the source of income that made you a you know a, a wealthy uh, a super super middle class uh, individual. So it's it's crazy to be using interest rates as a varying tool. And the reason the neoclassicals have done this is that they couldn't understand Keynes. So what happened instead was when Keynes's general theory was published, uh, John Hicks reinterpreted Keynes's arguments about investment under uncertainty to leave uncertainty out and said instead investment depends upon the rate of interest because the rate of interest changes the net present value of the cash stream you expect to get from investments. So if we put the rate of interest up, we're going to reduce the desire to invest and that made it look like you could fine tune investment by changing the rate of interest. But that's bollocks because again, what determines your willingness to invest is your expectations of profit. And they're much more volatile than tiny variations in the net present value. So it, it was irrelevant. And what neoclassicals did since then is when they dragged in, uh, uh, they started building their macro on microeconomics and they grabbed hold of Ramsey's growth model from the 18, 1920s. Ramsey's growth model fundamentally again used the idea of a, a discount rate on your utility driven by the rate of interest. So all their theories come back and tell them you should be using the rate of interest to control everything. And it's just bollocks. It's a textbook that doesn't apply to the real world being applied in the real world and making life for us real world denizens far more complicated. And frankly, the only way it works is by causing a credit crunch when they put rates up that much, which is what Vockler did back in the 1980s. And that gave us the crash of the, uh, the, the until then the greatest recession since the Great Depression broke the back of the working class, broke the trade unions, and led us into the so-called low inflationary period afterwards. But it wasn't from fine tuning; it was from causing a credit crunch. That is fascinating. I I feel like applauding because that was really <laughs> that's like you buy a ticket to go and, and listen to Steve Keen give a lecture, and that's why <laughs> I showed up. Right? That's. That's the information I wanted to get. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Well, it, That's great. Yeah. Well, do you interpret that? So the uh, the calculation of a firm for expectation of future profits just affect, do you think should just be affected by bank lending rates, adjustments based upon a constant um, central bank lending rate um, or zero, perhaps? Is that how you think of it? Or Yeah, I pretty mean, much. Are they still going to use that it, it, as a... This is what when you when you when you have examples where economists actually go and ask business people what they do, they always get a result which contradicts their theories. So again, if we go back to what's called the Oxford Economic Study Group back in the 1930s, this was a group of uh, marginalist neoclassical economists that used to call themselves marginalists back in those days, and they believed that the rate of interest was the important swing variable, and they believed rational rational costs rose. So they expected to find that's what businessmen would tell them. And they used to, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. Fred Lee has written, wrote a brilliant book called Post Keynesian Economic Theory, which is one of the most detailed, historically researched books in economics. And in that, he went through what actually happened with the Oxford Economic Study Group, as it was called. And what would happen is they would invite a specific industrialist to come up from London to Oxford University, wine and dine at Nuffield College, I think it was, with one of the member of the group who was a, a, ch a chairman of, uh, of Nuffield College. And then about a dozen would turn up and sit around in armchairs and have these conversations about, you know, how do you set prices, what determines your investment decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And the, it was cognitive dissonance because mm -hmm. The economists would expect rising marginal costs to be cutting off your production levels, and they'd be expecting varying interest rates to control your investment decisions. And the just was saying we don't give us we don't even think about interest rates. We decide to invest, and what's this about rising marginal costs? The main thing that, uh, that happens as we increase output is falling cost. So uh, you know the real world and economic economic theory have never met, do never meet, and when they do, they're puzzled about who the hell they're talking to.
So in some sense, how can you have the phrase uh, economies of scale and rising marginal costs at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. A- a- Andrew S- Sullivan asks, when Steve speaks about targeting, targeting bond buyers, would that require eliminating the primary dealer system? Not necessarily eliminating it, but I'd make them servants of the government system again, as they used to be back in the when I was uh, when I was a boy, uh, back <laughs> doing uh, economics at school, and this is when I was sixteen years old. We we learned about what called the LGS ratio, a local and government securities rule, and a rule that the banks were required to behave to. And this is back in Australia, obviously, uh, was that they had to buy twenty eight percent of their assets had to be local and government securities they were simply required to buy them so they were told what to do uh it was again called asset asset management by the central bank and what you could then do is tell the banks we've got to go from 28 percent to 35 percent etc etc or tell them you've got to sell bonds uh to the private sector or you've got to buy them off the private sector and i would preferably uh, I, I i think there is a reason to give banks bonds as an asset to operate with or to give them interest on reserves, which is the alternative way to go about it. But I would be using the bank's capacity to buy and sell bonds with the non-bank public uh, to use that to control the amount of money in circulation in the in the non-bank uh, financial sector. And that means actually selling bonds, not just to other financial institutions, but selling them to the public as well. And if we did that, then we could vary the rate of level of money in the economy fairly dramatically without varying the rate of taxation. And I think that's probably easier than the MMT idea yeah. of varying the tax <laughs> rate to to try to control level of aggregate demand. That's brilliant. And what do you... That's oh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, nothing but applause, Steve. That really makes <laughs> a lot of sense. I'm, I'm not going to press the applause button anymore, Dan. Oh. <laughs> Why? Because it, it'll, uh, what do they call that when they're marketing? If you oversaturate the market with the same yeah. thing over and over, they be, it becomes, I want to put, I want to put Carrie on the spot. Um, Carrie, we didn't actually have this feature last time. And we, we try to acknowledge, we have a lot of returning um, viewers each week. Um, and we always want to try to shout them out. So I've created a weekly list um, and I always get the guests to read it. And eh, your time has come up, so I'm going to put it up and have to read. And now, now, yeah, now, Dan, do you have any special speech you want to give around this? Any encouragement to carry how he should carry? You have to read it like you're trying to win an award. Okay, oh, let's get some oh. enthusiasm. <laughs> like you're trying to, you're an engineer, right? Okay, so you got to motivate a whole room of engineers to. I don't know. How do you get, how do you get engineers excited? uh free pizza yeah i don't know uh yeah yeah i can all come right. up with the, some jokes there but yeah 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 it's okay amp yourself up you gotta get it you all right all right there. go we go okay go all right so thank you everyone for joining us today so we're going to read off the names of people that are still joining us and no no no, no we about... don't need a speech at the beginning we just launch right into it we just, just need excitement okay. start with her okay go the people who care about <laughs> five physical economics and in understanding post keynesianism and accurate economics her wise man stephen hinton uh, I don't know if this is Hovian or Jovian R. N. Thank you, N. Uh, Stavros, Kara Georgios, uh, Hygro, Slick, S- Simulacrum, Christopher Dobby, Michael Del Souza, Del Souza Cruz, uh, WWE Fan 0104, D. Reggae, James James, Ghost in the Half Shell, Tom Roberts, Tomas Sergej, JPJ, or perhaps Jean Paul Jean, uh, David Branch, Political Economy 101, Dumbest in the Room podcast. Bob, Lior, TR, and last but not least, Lost Adult. Yeah. Good job. That was actually quite entertaining. I, I really yeah, he, enjoyed that. He's, he's swatting off. He's swatting me off. He's pushing through the mess. He yeah, just yeah, went yeah. for it. Gary, yeah. you were just, that was great. <laughs> So i has got a question here. Keen recently said he is sympathetic to a money tethered uh, to the biosphere and spoke of a constraint. Can he elaborate? Thank you, Steve. Okay. Well, one very immediate thing I want to do is bring in a parallel currency system uh, so that to go shopping, you've got to you both use your cash supply, but also use universal carbon credits, which would be created by the Treasury 
and then distributed on a daily or whatever basis to individuals at the level of the average for the entire economy. I wouldn't try to do it internationally because that's a way of making sure nothing actually gets done. So I'd have every American getting the average uh, universal carbon credit, which was equivalent to the average consumption of carbon by the by an American. Now, given the incredible uh, skewness of the distribution of income, that would mean that 95% of people would not would never exhaust their carbon credits, so they'd accumulate excess carbon credits. But of course, the top 5% would run out pretty much during breakfast, and they'd therefore be forced to buy universal carbon, excess universal carbon credits off the other 95%. So that would be a very strong uh, redistribution mechanism from the rich to the poor, It'd be a market mechanism, so neoclassicals couldn't complain about it, rather than trying to make up the price for carbon, which has been a total wank. This would be the market itself deciding that price. And it'll put enormous pressure on the rich to reduce the amount of carbon consumption they do because they're paying out through the nose for buying carbon. So the, they can decarbonize the economy more rapidly. They reduce their own cost, their financial costs. So that would be the very first thing I'd try to bring in. And the, the trick about it, and this is actually a clever trick that I can thank some neoclassicals for, if you did it that way, then every year the average would fall. So you'd have a falling average over time as well. So a very, very strong encouragement to decarbonize the economy. That'd be my transitional idea for a, a, a dual price system, monetary system. And in the long term, I think we need to get away from simply having money as, oh, pardon me. I'm having dinner delivered, so I've got to finish the question and go and open the door for the delivery. But that, pardon that's me. That's fine. We'll get Kerry, actually. This yeah. is your wheelhouse, Kerry. So, so, so maybe he's, uh, well, uh, uh, maybe not, not to a large degree, something I'd like to, again, further explore uh, more formally. But yeah, Steve is kind of mentioning this to some degree. Yeah, uh, maybe not exactly the same. The carbon fee and dividend uh, concept, which has been... Uh, essentially promoted by yeah uh, many you know neoclassical or orthodox uh, economists, Nobel Prize winners, and other other quote unquote prominent people. Uh, but yes, essentially a way to make the uh, carbon reduction more uh, equal, uh, equally spread amongst the uh, low income and high income. So I think this is uh, a good idea in in the class that I'm teaching uh, this semester. I'm phrasing uh, forcing the students to. Um, essentially prepare the whole semester to have a debate at the end of the semester. And one of the three questions, it's pointed just to force them into a pigeonhole, into a side of the argument. Uh, Steve's saying how we can maybe bridge these two sides. But it is essentially, uh, what's more important in the United States? Is it to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or is it to have more income inequality? And this idea of the sort of carbon credits or carbon fee and dividend idea, uh, however you employ it, is a way to try to balance these two uh, ideas is to say reduce greenhouse gas emissions and don't uh, you know, don't don't punish the the low income uh, citizens any more than they're already getting uh, held back in the economy. So, yeah. So this idea seems to have uh, merit with me as well. And uh, Steve, do you want to finish off your thoughts there before you know? Yeah. Okay. You know. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking the best thing to eat in Hungary is Thai food. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why they make great they make great desserts over here, but don't put them near the, the kitchen for main meals. Uh, basically, <laughs> main meals in Hungary involve re reducing their stock of salt. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, part, part, any, my probably any Hungarians. I'm loving living here, but nonetheless, I know I know what I can hear from them. I love Hungarian desserts. Okay, uh, long winded. Uh, disc discussion there. Yeah, I, I think we need to have a multi-dimensional monetary system for a sustainable human civilization in the future, because with the pressure of with money and profit and GDP, et cetera, et cetera, all those things at a single unidimensional scale, uh, we have enormous encouragement to accumulate and, and to turn raw energy into a source of profit, which is what we've been doing. And that is what's destroying the biosphere. So we need to set of so long as we're still continuing to produce on the biosphere and we're going to be stuck with that, particularly if we destroy capitalism, which I think is quite feasible, if we destroy the productive system here with the climate change, that's going to be our future indefinitely. But even if we got to the stage of producing off planet, you'd want to have a range of signals in your 
pricing system that encouraged things other than ripping the shit out of the ground and flogging it for a profit. So I would want to see, uh, you know, bias, uh, biosphere, um, uh, complexity of the biosphere, um, biodiversity, uh, carbon uh, reduction, et cetera, et cetera, elements to our monetary system, and then uh, try to develop a rather more philosophical and intelligent approach to this planet than we've done by having it all about how many bucks can you grab out of the ground and, and flog to other people and make a profit. What what's the um, here's a question here. What's the distinction? Oh, the, 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 uh, yeah, sorry, just Michael. No, this is not at all neoclassical. I'm just sending the bastards up because it's solving problems using a price system. What is the, the, the distinction between biophysical and ecological economics? That's a question that I've often had. Is there a difference or is it just different names? Gary? Uh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned and hearing, uh, you know, people discuss and maybe reading some things in the past is that the, the, whatever the distinction is, it's maybe not very important to me. So <clears throat> I guess one of the stories is that the biophysical sort of uh, community, if you will, was originally part of and an inspiration to start ecological economics as a field or as an official organization and, and, and field, uh, and then uh, became less focused uh, over time. So I would, if there was a distinction, I'd say the biophysical is a little bit more focused on the real stocks and flows of matter and energy in the economy and this sort of very uh, strict, well, not strict, but at least emphasizing that physical notion, whereas uh, the potential split was the some in the ecological economics community started going more towards a, uh, you know, maybe you, you might say neoclassical quantification of nature in terms of monetary units and natural resources and uh, ecosystem services and translating those to some sort of valuation, uh, usually in monetary terms. And that, you know, there might be a little bit of a split there, but there, uh, if anything, I would say biophysical is a subset of ecological economics and that would be yeah. my, I, I, I think it I think it reflects the origins as you're saying I mean ecological economics should take it back to Herman Daly uh, largely I'd say and um, biophysical economics you, you take it back to um, uh, bloody hell my Romanians going out <laughs> my head um, uh, no, I don't know I try to think of a name well, no, just Rogan sure. um, yeah so there's there's more of a the biophysical is more focused upon the, the fact we're to actually have an economy we're transforming inputs of nature into forms we can actually exploit whereas the ecological is is more you know um, we should have other interests apart from just money blah 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 um, so there, there's two different origin points but they converge on each other because what they have both fundamentally is they're they're focused upon the real world <laughs> neoclassical economics is you know, whiteboard economics, where you can write terms down that that look like they're um, got something to do with an economy, wages, prices, blah blah blah. But they're leaving out the physical world, and they have a they have a model of production that involves no inputs from the natural environment, is just insane. But that's what they've done. So that's that's why ecological and biophysical, even though they've got you know they've got different historical origins. They're completely opposed to the neoclassical vision, which presumes you can make something out of nothing. That relates to another one of M's questions too, by the way. Yeah, I was going to get to M's question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, both would start with a circle that says, "Here's the earth or our resources," and the economy is inside of that circle. Yeah. Uh, both would, you know, lecture number one and either a, a class on either would start with that uh, premise. And then as uh, yeah, our listener M is asking something like, is, you know, is infinite knowledge going to can supersede the idea of <clears throat> atoms and matter? So I think the biophysical and ecological side says, no, I've got to quantify something about the environment in terms of a quantity of mass or something that probably relates to atoms and matter and say that those are the resources that we use our knowledge to, to rearrange. And so I, you know, I have a hard time understanding knowledge outside of the context of uh, one embodying that knowledge in something physical. I, there could be some philosophy or some uh, uh, physics that says it's possible to quantify information in some way that's not embodied in matter or an arrangement of energy, but I, I don't know of it. Um, so yeah, infinite. I don't know how to even think about knowledge if you don't recognize that there's a, a, a limited source of atoms and a limited ways of arranging them. And the ways we try to understand a limited ways of arranging them is essentially what we'd call the laws of physics. 
James is saying something I agree with. What is James saying? <laughs> wouldn't I wouldn't on piss on them if they were on fire, Steve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who them is. Yeah, my name. Depends <laughs> if my piss was flammable, then I might consider it. <laughs> Um, I have to give some props to <laughs> this Encore.org. This is really a cool website, and I think uh, <clears throat> we should share it. It's Ecocore. Core.org. Yeah. Dot org. Yeah. And I put it. I put it in the chat, guys. Yeah, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen. This is a. It's on a. <clears throat> It's on a graphic here, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I want to talk through uh, some some concern here. Um, it's an ambitious. I'll tell you why it's ambitious. I love this number one set carbon allowance emissions. Um, I'm fine with the carbon bank. I'm fine with getting it to the citizens. S this starts to get quite. Um, heavy by running a dual system. I think every market and good, every ATM, or not ATM, but like, just think of a grocery checkout. Everything has to have a, a dual split sort of system. And I think that like from industry that are like, how in the world would you, <laughs> how are you gonna do that? So that's my question. What do you, like, this is great. Um, but is there redundancy in that, right? I mean, I know it's the, probably the best way to get the proper accounting. And look at this. Every oil, gas, and coal company must account for every kilo of carbon with some value of carbon, carbon tokens obtained from their, their, their customers. So, wow, this is really interesting. It's a real a circular accounting, but it's so – it duplicates so much in industry here. Like we can just wave our fingers and get industry to totally put a two, you know, two kind of, you know, account for the carbon and uh, currency and also the, the regular currency. I need some help with that, guys. Yeah, That's I'm probably ask. Uh, open to whether something like this can 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 get pulled off. Um, That's what I was trying you know, to if say. You're, right? If you're in the life cycle assessment community, you would say, well, this is the kind of thing we do and we're creating this information and we have ways to embed this information into different products. And then there's the practical idea of, well, okay, how do you embed this in, in products? And over time, uh, just you know, for better or for worse, more you know, smartphone use and um, is, is making this thing a little bit possible. Let's just think about going to the grocery store and I you know, traveled in the UK uh, a little bit this summer and you know, I, a little bit happened in the United States. People, you know, essentially going into the store, collecting things, checking out without anybody else there. So there's a lot of information embedded in barcodes. Of course, it's usually just the price and then tracking what you bought so that the store knows here's the things that people are buying, what they need to order. So in principle, you'd have to embed the carbon information into the barcode. And so the question is, okay, can we pull that off in a way that people buy into the correct accounting system and uh, everybody accepts the accounting system, and that's, I think, where the fundamental challenge is, is, yeah, what is the other accounting system? I'm probably okay with keeping it separate from just embedding it in the price. Uh, if we do that, then, you know, we can at least understand it more simpler. Of course, you know, there's been lots of discussion about just embedding carbon in the price uh, directly, but then you still have to know how much carbon is associated with each product. Steve, what are your thoughts on the adoptability? Uh, th this to me feels like the weak section of links in the in, in the chart. I've, I've come up with something similar myself. It's all it's all money orientated. It's kind of like a, a universal basic income. Uh, but I really love your idea of pegging it to the individual um, uh, country, right? Country specific. So um, I really think that's a smart move. Um, I do the same in, in, you know, the, the, the system that I'm kind of organizing the idea that I have, but, um, do you see this as a bit of a, uh, an inefficiency, just adoption, trying to get industry to move over that quickly, or can you think of a, a better, more efficient delivery mechanism or system? Well, that's fundamentally, I'm thinking this is actually a point that was asked by Michael, the moment Michael D'Souza Cruz, 
aren't we past the point of sustainability? I think absolutely, yes, we are. So we're going to be forced, and we're going to, there's two ways we're going to experience degrowth, by, by force or by, or by design. And by force will be far worse than by design. So this is an idea that would uh, enable us, if it was done before we hit whatever brick wall the climate's going to throw our way, to start doing a bit of degrowth by design. Uh, because it was an enormous reduction in the, uh, it, it would it would be pretty much forcing capitalists, wealthy, very wealthy people, to cut back on their consumption, and they're the ones we need to get to make cut back quite dramatically. Um, but the other side of it is that I think we're going to need rationing on the other side of what we're going to experience at some point. If we have a collapse in food supplies, you simply can't allow the price of food uh, to be the determinant of whether you can afford to eat or not. And that then you're going to get social breakdown and a collapse in civilization. Uh, and that's what we've, we've got to desperately try to do is to hold on to civilization through the catastrophe that neoclassical economists have led us blindly into. So rationing is going to be vital. In the Second World War, it was ration cards and, uh, and a very stylized consumption pattern that you could have. Uh, in, the, in the collapse we're going to go through, if societies can hold together, then we're going to need some form of rationing, and it'll be if we if we can still have data service, then it'll be in information based electronic, and this would be a way of doing it with rather more flexibility than you can get out of a straight ration card. Yeah, 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 yeah. I look at it and I think uh, we're in big trouble as well, um, and I I think the idea of putting a, a dividend aspect to it is. Um, is not fair in terms of being truthful. Um, you know, and I kind of envision my universal basic income approach, national based, I think about it and I, I say, yeah, you can take the average individuals, um, like the average income for an American citizen, Canadian citizen, um, Hungarian, whoever, wherever you're from, and that's where your, your income is. But there's going to be down. There's going to be a lot of downward pressure on on sustaining that income level, uh, and on an individual basis, unless there's um, like a mass transformation and and integration into like a health a new form of healthy economy, and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tough. And I I I think that the 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 people that are coming forward and saying this is going to be tough. It's it, it's you know that's what you got to sign up for, right? We're at, we're at war with the climate, basically, to make ourselves compatible with the way the, the climate, what, what blows the climates are going to be throwing our way. We have to be, um, we have to adapt to that. And that's not going to be easy mm. with our current population levels. So, yeah. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, there's one of the ironies that people like, you know, Kerry starting to build and, and, and Ty taking my models and building them together as well, having integrated biophysical models of the economy, finally, we're doing it on the verge of the collapse of capitalism. And it ain't mm -hmm. our fault, it's the neoclassicals who blindly led us to this point because they lack the biophysical awareness that it's an integral part of how Kerry and I both think. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Kerry, I want to make a recommendation of a, of a book and also to Steve, if you haven't read it, I've mentioned him before, but Antonio Damasio, uh, he's a neuroscientist and uh, hold, hold, he, hold on, Dan, you're not going to yeah. recommend it to me as well. Like, am I just a pile of shit sitting in the corner of the room, Dan? You know what? There's no reason why Ty can't read Antonio as well. So let me, there you let go. me read. Okay, okay. Yeah. Why did I skip over Ty in that case? Man, there's there no go. reason. He's doing Maybe because excellent. he's wearing a tie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. You, 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 you stuttered my, uh, my mental approach, right? Okay. So here's the Antonio Damasio and you can read um, pretty much any of his books. The research is probably where you guys want to focus. The reason being is that he's rock solid on on states of homeostasis from a biological standpoint. I know this is individual agent based, but he also goes into cultures. And I think his research is top notch. I think he's He's uh, he's he's uh, maybe really good for for your research. Incorporate it, think about it, right? Have a look at some of what he's published, and then maybe some of his popular work as well. Um, yeah, I've heard him in the book in the, in the chat. I, so. 
Dang I've heard him cool. interviewed on some podcasts and things, and yeah, he has some. I think some some, some interesting. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of interesting things to say, and I. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna put. He's got a few books, so I'm not gonna make a particular one. Uh, or if I did, I'd have to make two because his book on culture is probably a good one. And uh, let me see here. What <laughs> sitcom is the intro from, Ty? Yeah. <laughs> so so I I looked a few people commented, but didn't guess right on in the comments last week or in the chat. It is Saved by the Bell from the 1990s. Oh. Um, at least the graphical style, that's where it's from, not the music. So, Michael, that is the answer to your question. The mystery is over. Saved by the Bell, 1990s. I was still young then. <laughs> you still are young compared to some of us here. I'm yeah. start, the, these high powered lights are actually showing some of the gray the gray light. highlights yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like the yeah. ones early i'm living with gray low lights these days <laughs> yeah yeah gray low lights yeah i got more of the low lights coming than some gray <laughs> the gray in the low part of the beard yeah <laughs> Yeah, man, like it's like a middle-aged man bashing thing. There was one guy that came on there, and he looked like he was African American. It must have been a spammer. We say we have the most intelligent people, right? Looks like African American fellow that has K K K K K K. And I was looking at, it, I go, what would give that impression? A bunch of white guys on the show. <laughs> but you know, where do the spammers come from? You know, it's like. <laughs> Oh, him? He's actually, he's uh, he's from the MMT activist community, I believe. Um, well, he I might not him. have been implying the KKK thing. I don't know what he was. What he yeah, was I, saw, I saw it too, but I, I've seen him around on Twitter. Um, I've I had a few, and he seemed like a nice guy. I don't know what, what the KKK, KKK meant. I don't think it was in re relation to that. I don't think no, so. Not. Mm. Yeah, hope not. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we might be shut down again, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all we need. We're a constant threat of being shut down on YouTube after forty mm. episodes. Yeah, there's there, maybe there's like a, a Steve Keen um, swearing counter or something that Google's. You know, it just keeps going up. I'm at, I it's am like actually, the fuckery meter. <laughs> I, I, yeah, perfect. I'm going to employ that on the show. The fuckery meter. Yeah, and it's going to count each time that, that we swear. It's going to pop up on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> well, use it on use it if you really need to. Uh, if there's a meter there, they're just kind of throwing them out here, only to get canceled instead of uh, yeah. in a meaningful way. So yeah, use them sparingly. So you have a you have a, a yeah. blasphemy carbon credit, and uh, they can get traded among us. But you have to use them sparingly. Now I I will add. Last week was our our <laughs> That's fourth. That's brilliant, Carrie. Forget the double currency. Just have like a fuck meter spend. It's <laughs> So yeah, we got to mute it's him a now. Fourth what, get... <laughs> a fourth time? What? Fourth what? Uh, uh, so last week uh, was, a, was our fourth highest viewed show on YouTube. Um, so hopefully, you know, us switching up some styles here helps us get to a broader audience. Because if not, you know, <laughs> maybe we should stop doing this. So anyways, hopefully the trend continues. We've had about 15 average people on Twitter, sitting around 35 average people watching here on YouTube. So we've been sitting around 50 people watching. So it's it's doing a little bit better. Um, oh, here we go. The min, Minstrel. He's redeeming 55. himself. He's engaging. This we got him back. Good. We pulled him from the abyss. Okay, good. Uh, Mistral, <laughs> Mistral 55. He's redeemed himself. Oh yeah. yeah, right here, right here. He doesn't doesn't. Okay, okay. I didn't think that was the case, anyways. It didn't make sense because there's too many <laughs> cases. So, thanks for thanks for joining in. I've seen you on on Twitter, I believe, or now X. It's, I'm glad you uh, joined us on the show. We always like new people coming in. We're kind of reaching the end of the show at this point. I'd like to say thank you. To Kerry King, King for being on the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Always a pleasure to chat and it's a good conversation. 
You can get his book, The Economic Superorganism. I'm sure that's on Amazon and wherever you buy books nowadays. Isn't that right, Carrie? Yes, all of your uh, best-selling online retailers. Yes, so buy it from an o- online local retailer. Yeah, get it shipped in person, I, in physical or online. Yes. And, you know, if you want to have Carrie on your own podcast or live stream, well, it's a perfect title name. The Economic Super Organism by Carrie Keene. Anyways, guys, we will see you next week. We've got David Fields for Steve Keen, Daniel Sanderson, Carrie King. I'm Ty Keens. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.